so now uh, Al Gore runs against the Sun and that election becomes the most awful. Un well, Al Gore distances himself from Clinton, separates himself from the Clinton record. Oh, but, yeah, but, but we have to understand in context that Bill Clinton is a very popular figure in the Democratic Party and in, and in public life generally. But at that point in the story, he's an impeached president. Well, yeah, but the, the, the studies all show that distancing himself cost Gore. That had he embraced the economic record, who knows? Mm -hmm. I mean, Gore certainly paid for it, but I remember the convention that year was here in Los Angeles, and I was going down to introduce some of the Fox News people to some of the people running the convention, and of all things, the President of the United States should call me on the phone. Imagine that. Imagine happens that. Happens to me all the time. It hasn't happened to me on the time since, but. Yeah. And he's, I said, look, I'm about to go down to meet Bill Daly and everybody talk about the convention. He said, great, perfect. It's just when I wanted to catch him. He said, when you get there, I said, what's your story? What's your plan? He said, oh, God, it's awful. I'm coming in and I'm speaking, you know, Monday night. And then they had me getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go to a football field in Michigan to, you know, raise my hand with Gore, right? I have a much better idea. He said, and I want it to be your idea when you go to this meeting tonight. Which is that on Monday night, once I start my speech and everybody's in the hall, Gore gets on a plane. Let's say he's in Phoenix, all right? And he flies to LAX. Nobody knows because everybody's in the convention hall. Nobody's following. There's a big embargo. He flies into LAX and he drives to the convention hall with a limited press group. And then as I'm in my speech talking about if you want to continue the peace and prosperity of the last four years, the underground camera, which we That's all dangerous. know about at Staples, will pick up Al Gore coming into the hall. And the crowd in the convention hall will go berserk, right? Because they're all Gore delegates. And he'll come in, they'll see him come in, he'll join me on the podium just as I get to the point where if you want to continue the peace and prosperity of the last four years and we'll raise our arms in the air in front of a hundred million people on television and I won't have to get up at four o'clock in the morning to go to Michigan. I got the chills. I said, that is a really great idea. He said, it'll make Monday night count. He then leaves, Gore then leaves and leaves town again. He said, so they're going to tell you that there aren't enough hotel rooms in Los Angeles for both our press course. I said, yeah, that's true. He said, so the answer is, they're not gonna stay in Los Angeles. They fly in at six o'clock Pacific time. They fly out at nine o'clock Pacific time. They can go to any place else in California. They can go to Arizona. They can go to Stockton. They can go to Nevada. They can go anywhere they want, and then they come back on Wednesday night. I said, that's good. He said, the other thing they're going to hit you with, be ready, is that Gephardt has a fundraiser he's doing for Mon Monday night. Tell him Gephardt can move the fundraiser. He said, are you ready? You got it? I said, I got it. I got it. I got a brilliant idea. Right. And even I thought I had this brilliant idea when I drew on downtown. I sit down with the people. I introduce Fox people. Fox people leave. Now the real meeting can begin. I say, I've got an idea. Bill Daly looks at me and says, you've got an idea? I said, yeah. I said, it has to do with Monday night. He looks at me and says, you were talking to him. I said, forget about him. This is my idea. Well, I lay out the idea. The first thing he says to me is, what about the hotel room? So I said, I've got the answer. Yes, we're going to leave by nine. We're going to leave by nine. Stockton, Phoenix, Las Vegas. We can go anywhere in an hour. He said, in the Get Part fundraiser? He said, you got he'll that one? It. I said, he'll move it. He's agreed. Yeah. He can move it. Bill Daly looks at me and says, yesterday it was Terry McAuliffe's idea. I said, well, fine, brilliant <laughs> minds think alike. And he said, Gore won't do it. I said, why won't he do it? He said, he, he's afraid Clinton will upstage him, take over the stage. Yeah. I tootle on home, the phone's ringing when I walk in the house. 
That's why it has operator number 01 for me again, right? This is my lucky day. Not one phone call, but two phone calls from the President of the United States. How did you do? Not so well. He said, you get past the hotel room. So I did. How about the get part of that? The get part of that, I took care of that. He said, so what's the deal? I said, he doesn't want to do it with you. He thinks, you know, you'll be on the same stage with him, you'll upstage him. And Clinton said to me on the phone that night, he said, you know, you have to be really big mm -hmm. to run for president. And this is his convention. This is his crowd. If he thinks I'm going to upstage him there, I said, I know. It's a good point. It was a good point, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that was 2000, and we have George W. Bush. Mm. And then, of course, 9-11. And then 9-11. Where were you? Uh, with my kids in bed when the phone rang. In Los Angeles. In Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And you watch the world go to hell. That was the world then, and this is the world now of Donald Trump, who... Mm -hmm. Were you shocked? No. No, I wasn't. I wrote a book called The Case for Hillary Clinton 10 years ago, and I went on a book tour that was like no book tour I ever went on in my life. How so? I came home in the fetal position. <laughs> I like Hillary enormously, but Hillary, the politician, was carrying a lot of baggage into that election. Namely, she was an establishment political figure. Who had the email controversy and who lots of people thought was not trustworthy and not honest. And you add a little sexism in there and you add a little maybe um, uh, email shredding and that sort of thing in there. Clinton duplicity. And she didn't have... I mean, Bill Clinton had a gift. He walked into the room, whoom, you could, I used to joke with people, you can tell me up until you're blue in the face how much you don't like him. I'll bring him in this room and he'll have you in 15 minutes. Not I swear even. to God, Less. and I'll be sitting there just getting myself a cold glass of water and mm. you'll be gone. Mm -hmm. um, she didn't have that. That's a gift. It's magic. When you asked me what I thought of Clinton, I thought he had magic. But I thought Reagan so, had matched. So did you know a day before, a week Yeah, before, I canceled my class on that Monday because I couldn't stand up and tell him Hillary was going to win. And all my pollster friends were saying, were saying it was fine. And it didn't feel fine. It felt not fine. Okay? I've spent too many years on Fox News and too many years on talk radio not to hear the debates and know that some of what Trump was saying was bound to be hitting a chord. That people are, you know, frustrated and having a difficult time and having this woman who's sort of a policy wonk talking about Senate bills while the other guy is saying, drain the damn swamp. Yes. Some of that's going to come through. You know, and there Clinton, was a lot of Hillary hatred out there. Bill, Bill Clinton said, I guess in the year leading up to the, the Trump victory, the most unexpected, shocking uh, victory that some Republic, many Republicans think that uh, politicians can't run a two-car parade. Right. And there's a lot of that. Right. They, they, and and the only answer I would the, give as we come to a close is, it was a famous William Sapphire column, former columnist for the New York Times. And he said, when you call a plumber, do you want a guy who's unclogging his first drain? <laughs> <laughs>